Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we talk with Dr. Christopher Busby, who has been tremendously effective in fighting the nuclear industry. We will be discussing the recent UK court case he conducted on behalf of British military veterans who had been exposed to nuclear radiation, a court case that aims to once and for all establish the legal difference between external and internal radiation exposure and the dangers of even the smallest internal dose. Plus, Numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report, and more honest nuclear information than has been or will ever be mentioned in the entire Democratic National Convention. See how even-handed I am? All of this will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, July 26, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting off in Japan, where according to a report issued by Greenpeace, radiation levels in the seabed off Fukushima is hundreds of times higher than prior to the disaster. This conclusion was reached as a result of a study during which scientists analyzed radioactivity levels along Fukushima's rivers and the Pacific seabed off the coast. I. Kashiwagi, energy campaigner at Greenpeace Japan, said... These river samples were taken in areas where Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's government is stating it is safe for people to live. But the results show there is no return to normal after this nuclear catastrophe. In addition to showing that there is hundreds of times more radioactive substances in the seabed off Fukushima's coast than there was prior to 2011, The study showed that the level of hazardous materials along local rivers is 200 times higher compared to the Pacific Ocean seabed. Scientists warned in the press release, the vast territories, including contaminated forests and freshwater systems, will remain a perennial source of radioactivity for the foreseeable future. So are you still planning to attend the 2020 Tokyo Nuclear Olympics? Ah, the power of the bureaucrat. When is radioactive waste no longer radioactive waste? When the government says so. And that's exactly what the Japanese government did on Friday, July 22nd, when it informed the city of Chiba that the radioactive designation for 7.7 tons of Fukushima-tainted waste stored in that city would be lifted the very next day, allowing it to be treated as general garbage. The decision came after it was found that the radioactive activity of cesium in the waste had fallen below the state-set limit, bureaucrats again, state-set limit of 8,000 becquerels per kilogram. 7,999, hey, no problem, it's just put it out with the rice cartons and broken tatami mats. Mayor Kumagai has expressed his intention to keep this waste in storage for the time being wise man that he is. But at the end of March, 172,899 tons of such designated waste was being stored in Chiba, Tokyo, and 10 other prefectures in eastern Japan. Speaking of radioactive waste, our thanks to Fukuleaks.org for the following story. Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Authority has instructed TEPCO to deal with the radioactive water in the reactor building basements at Fukushima Daiichi. The request included reducing the radioactive contamination in the water and also the volume. The addition of more holding tanks was included in the request. You think they don't know this already? The NRA appears to be concerned with contaminated water leaking out of the reactor buildings or being flushed out by a tsunami at the plant. Groundwater levels around the reactor buildings appear to be strongly influenced by the amounts of rain at a given time. If TEPCO were to remove all of the contaminated water, they would need enough storage tanks to hold 61,600 tons of water. 
This also could be problematic, as Unit 1 is known to have fuel fragments and possibly corium, melted fuel from the core, in the Taurus room at the basement level. Draining that water could create other problems. Ya think? According to Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, the meat of wild boar in Fukushima was measured to have 960 becquerels per kilogram of cesium. Remember that in Japan, only 100 becquerels of cesium per kilogram of anything is allowable in food. That's what's allowed. We're not saying that it's good for you. The sampling on the wild boar meat was June 11 of this year, and significant density of cesium-134 and 137 was detected in all 33 wild boar samples. The ministry reports that none of the meat from these wild boar was distributed for sale. So what, it ended up in school lunches? Two stories now that give new meaning to the Watergate-era term, follow the money. Regional banks in Fukushima Prefecture are reopening outlets in radiation-contaminated areas to help lure residents back. These regional banks are so eager to play a trailblazing role by allowing residents to use their branches as places to socialize. Yeah, that'll bring them back. And who are you going to get to work there? Toho Bank, which is based in the city of Fukushima, restarted its branch in Naraha in April, even though in the 10 months since the evacuation order was lifted, only 8.1% of the residents had returned as of July 4th of this year. But as the chief of that bank, Hiroshi Yamaka, said, it's not easy to achieve industrial revival in contaminated areas neglected by the long evacuation. And a newly revealed memo shows that residents of Hamaoka received 3 billion yen to host a nuclear reactor. It was called cooperation money, but that might be a Japanese euphemism for bribe. The Hamaoka facility has been described as the most dangerous nuclear plant in Japan because of its proximity to a long-expected huge earthquake off the prefecture. And now... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, has admitted asking the provider of the popular Pokemon Go smartphone game to change settings so that the game's virtual characters will not appear at a nuclear power plant. TEPCO said it had detected at least one Pokemon character within the premises of one of three TEPCO nuclear power stations that were tested, the three being the radioactive remains of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster, the Fukushima Daini plant, which is in Fukushima Prefecture as well, and the Kashiwazaki Kariwa plant in Niigata Prefecture. It is also called on plant workers not to play Pokemon Go on the premises of the power stations. Oh, what could go wrong? Look, this is probably a generational thing, but I never understood what Pokemon was. I don't know what it does. And all I know is that people are staring at their screens of their smartphones and stepping into traffic and off cliffs. Now they're going into nuclear power stations. What are they thinking? This is all to catch virtual creatures that are invisible in real life, but that only appear superimposed on smartphone screens. I do believe that the best thing they could do is come up with a Pokemon character called Radiation. And wouldn't it be great if a smartphone screen could show that? Faced with this new threat to nuclear security and common sense, Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Authority issued a notice to electricity companies about enforcing security to prevent Pokemon Go users from entering their facilities, including nuclear power plants. Game developer Niantic says the area around Fukushima should be exclusion zones in Pokemon Go and that no game characters should appear anywhere near the dangerous site. How about continuing to make them and the areas around them exclusion zones in real life so that no human beings, no people would... Oh, well, who cares about them anyway? 
And that's why Pokemon Go users all over the world, you en masse, group conscience, lack of class action suit, are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. Over to the United States, where the Utah Court of Appeals has ruled to allow a nuclear power plant on the ironically named Green River, which may not be so green if it gets a nuclear power plant. The unanimous opinion affirms the 7th District Court's 2013 ruling that the Blue Castle Holdings plan for a nuclear reactor would not, repeat, not overly tax the river by diverting water to cool a pair of nuclear reactors. Well, let's just look at Indian Point, which uses 2.5 billion gallons of water a day to cool those reactors, and the water that it returns to the river is 18 to 20 degrees hotter. But really, Utah, it's not going to do any damage to your river at all, or to tourism, which I think is a pretty big industry for your state. Opponents of the plan say they are still optimistic because the project has failed to attract investment. Speaking of investments, the motley fool went overboard in praising General Electric's new small modular reactor design. Only if you read the fine print at the bottom of the article do you learn, quote, the motley fool owns shares in General Electric. Time for the nuclear reactor duck <coughs> and cover report. In New Jersey, the Salem 2 nuclear plant has been shut down for the fourth time in a month because of a problem with its main generator. It was restarted on Thursday, July 21st, shut down again on Sunday the 24th. Other shutdowns occurred on June 28th. It was restarted on July 3rd, shut down on the 4th, turned on on the 11th, and ran for only seven hours. Would somebody please shoot it and put it out of its misery? <coughs> NRC is going to need on-site AA at Farley in Alabama and Fitzpatrick in New York, where in the last week both sites had non-licensed supervisory personnel who tested positive for alcohol. Alcohol and nukes. What could go wrong? <coughs> I love this one. During the planned NRC FEMA evaluated drill exercise on July 13, two press releases written in the Joint Information Center were published in the Public Information and Emergency Response System without, quote, this is a drill, in capital letters, denoted at the top of the page. As a result, the local radio station affiliate was not aware of the exercise nature of the information they were receiving. As a result, the said affiliate station, they never provided the call letters on it, but the station thought it was a real event and read the press releases over the airways not once, but twice. It took almost four hours before the radio station learned the truth and was able to tell their listening audience of the mistake. The NRC states that this event is not significant with respect to the health and safety of the public. Yeah, except for those people who are listening to the radio and have heart conditions. <coughs> and on August 4th, anyone who lives or works within a 10-mile radius of Beaver Valley Nuclear Power Station in Shippingport, Pennsylvania, is eligible to receive free potassium iodide tablets. What do they know that we don't? And that's this week's Nuclear Reactor Duck <laughs> and Cover Report. Internationally, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is investigating allegations contained in an anonymous letter claiming to be written by specialists at the nuclear regulator that says information has been withheld from commissioners while making critical decisions about the licensing of the country's nuclear plants. From radiation-free Lakeland in the U.K., anti-nuclear and citizens groups have slammed the plan to stack shipping containers ever higher at the U.K.'s low-level high-rise nuclear waste dump. Low-level being a euphemism for a cocktail of relatively short-lived, intensely radioactive species such as tritium, cesium, strontium, and plutonium. Hungary has closed the PAX nuclear reactor after control equipment malfunctions. And in a ray of good hope, new nuclear reactor builds internationally 
fell to zero in the first half of 2016. Here's this week's featured interview. Dr. Christopher Busby, that's his formal name, everyone in our movement calls him Chris, is a British nuclear scientist who has been active, effective, visible, and often controversial for his ability to not only get the work done, but get it noticed. Officials had tried to shut him down, shut him out, shut him up, and nothing works because, well, you'll hear a bit of his indomitable nature in this interview. We discussed the recent lawsuit in the United Kingdom regarding British military veterans exposed to nuclear radiation and their attempts to gain compensation for their illnesses and the pains that they have gone through. In this latest case, he has played an even more remarkable role than usual. This is an important interview to listen to if you are dealing legally or legislatively with the nuclear industry's claim that exposure to low-level radiation cannot harm you. Chris Busby, thank you so much for joining us again on Nuclear Hot Seat. Hello, Libby. I'm very pleased to be here. I hope I can contribute something useful. You usually do. British nuclear test veterans in the UK have been battling with the Ministry of Defense and the Home Office regarding compensation for nuclear radiation exposure. Give us a sense of the background of this case. So I first was approached in 2004 to act as an expert witness for a nuclear test veteran called Gerald Adsett who was who died. His uh, widow was trying to get a, a pension. Now the way this works is that you can get a pension so long as whatever it was that hurt you occurred during the time that you were in, in the army. Uh, and these young men, well, he was one of them, they were national servicemen. That is to say they were conscripted in the 1950s. And they went to work at one of the two nuclear test sites, one, either one in Australia or one Christmas Island, which is a little atoll in the Pacific, to help develop the British nuclear deterrent, if you'd like to call it that, to, to create a hydrogen bomb or a thermonuclear bomb. And at that time, it was very important for Britain to become a member of the nuclear club, as it were, because it was clear that whoever was in the nuclear club could determine political direction in some way. You know, they had clout. So the British were scrambling to produce a nuclear bomb, and so they conducted tests in, in Australia up until about 1957. And then the Australians politely asked them to go away because the, the, the fallout from the Australian tests in the desert in Maralinga were actually drifting over the um, populated areas of Australia. And obviously, when they were going to have even bigger bombs, these big thermonuclear bombs, they had to go somewhere a bit more remote. So they relocated to Christmas Island in the Pacific. So this guy had been exposed, but the military said he hadn't because they said that nobody got a, a very high dose. And therefore, the fact that he got cancer couldn't have been caused by the radiation dose because it was too low. And so I went in as an expert and we won the case, or rather the appeal that he made against his refusal to get a pension was overturned. And so from then on, I did about six cases with different people who got in touch with me. And I started to get quite famous amongst the veterans for somebody who could go in as an expert and win the case for them. At the point that I was steaming ahead on winning these cases, I had two or three cases coming up. The, the Ministry of Defence put 16 of these cases into a big test case where it was all, one all to be heard together in a big court case in London. And I was then commissioned by the solicitors for these 16 to act as an expert. This is all a bit long-winded, but you need to know the background to all of this. So by now we're up to 2011. And I've won four or five of these cases, and there were a couple of them ongoing. By 2012, the solicitors who I was working for, the, the attorneys, that they pulled out. It's not really clear why they pulled out. My own feeling is it's a bit suspicious. Because at that time, I, I'd written about 10 or 11 reports for the various uh, individuals that were in the case. And the way in this was working was that the Ministry of Defence were writing a report, then I would write a report, and then they would write a report. And I, so it, it was sort of a bit like a ping-pong game. But it was being controlled by the judge, who was a very important man. Uh, uh, his name was Hugh Stubbs. He was a top mason, but he was a good guy. And he had been the judge in a number of these cases that I'd won. And generally, he liked me and said that I was a proper scientist and, you know, knew what I was talking about and so forth. 
Anyway, so they pulled out, and a new outfit called Hogan Lovells International, quite a big posh law firm, came in, and they took it over. And then just before the big cases were to be heard, all in one go, that was in 2013, they threw me out. They said, we're not going to rely on Dr. Busby's evidence. That was all thrown out. And as a consequence, this, I argue, they lost the case. So all of the people, they didn't get their pensions. The case was lost. I managed to persuade a couple of these veterans to appeal the decision on the basis that my evidence had been excluded without Hogan Lovells actually asking their clients whether or not I should be excluded. I mean, you know, the, the way in which this works normally, if you represent somebody, if you're a solicitor and you represent a client, you're supposed to communicate with the client what it is you're doing. And if you want to throw out your main witness, you ought to at least ask the veteran whether or not they thought that was a good idea. And of course, they knew that what would happen is the veteran would say, no, it's not a good idea because this bloke's won a whole load of these cases in a row. So it might be a good idea to continue to use him. Anyway, they didn't. So we went to an appeal, and the appeal uh, was won. We won the appeal. It's called the upper tier. So you now go to quite a posh court. And in the posh court, there was this guy called Sir William Charles, who was the upper tier judge. And he said, all right, I'll send it down to be heard all over again. But at the time that he was doing this, the Ministry of Defence came along and they put in a, an application that I should be thrown out as an expert anyway, because A, I'm not an expert, and B, I'm some crazy guy who chains himself up to nuclear power stations and walks into meetings with like Handel, you know, like um, Hamlet, you know, with a skull and all this kind of stuff that I go in for. Both of which happen to be true. At the same time, tell people what your background is so that they understand the nature of your scientific credentials as we're talking about this. I know what I'm talking about. I got a first class honors degree in chemical physics, and, and then I got a PhD in chemical physics from the University of Kent, University of London. And I've been studying the health effects of radiation for about 26 years now, and I've published over 35 peer-reviewed papers in the area. So it's, it's really quite hard for them to argue that I'm not an expert in this area. And also, I've worked in America in a number of radiation court cases, so I had a lot of really quite posh American lawyers write affidavits, you know, saying that I was a fabulous expert and the greatest expert that ever lived and so forth. Um, so this, this all came before the judge, and he concluded that I was an expert. But the problem is under English law that you're not allowed to be an expert if you're also an activist. And he made it quite clear that because I was an activist, it meant I had a specific point of view and, of course, I said that all scientists have a specific point of view. That, I mean, the Ministry of Defense experts all believe that the current risk model is right. They all believe that the doses are too low. They all, they all have a position. In fact, all scientists have a position, depending upon the way in which they interpret the facts. That is absolutely true. The idea that you can have an expert, and that expert tells you what science says in some sort of rather ridiculous Peter and Jane way, is just total nonsense, you know? That isn't what science is about. Science is a continuous argument about the current understanding of the world and the evidence that suggests that that current understanding may not be right. Anyway, I said all this stuff, and I was cross-examined in the witness box for three days. <laughs> it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. You were cross-examined as to the specifics of your understanding of radiation and its impact on yes, the body. Yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I was put under hostile cross-examination by the Ministry of Defense as to all of the evidence that I'd put in, because one of the arguments had been that if, if my evidence had been heard, it wouldn't have made any difference anyway, which was just complete nonsense. Make it clear. Sorry. What was their contention and what was your counter contention that they were discounting? This is just a bit of historical stuff, okay, because we're going to now move forward to the current case, right? So, and, then, and, and since everything that I argued at that time in the upper tier, in the appeal court, and everything that I argued in my reports to the first hearing, which were discounted, which were dismissed, but, you know, set aside, it's all the same argument. So we'll come back to that argument, but I'll just take you forward from what happened. So they, they decided that I couldn't be an expert under English law. I can still be an expert under American law because it's a different law. But anyway, under English law, they said the judge ruled I couldn't be an expert. But he said there was no reason why I couldn't actually be the attorney. I couldn't be the representative, you see, with a slight smile on his face. So anyway, at that point, I got my uh, appellants to choose me, to put me as their representative, to designate me as their representative, their legal representative. 
So now I get a chance to get up like Perry Mason in court, you know, and actually be the main man, which is actually, I tell you, is much more powerful than being the expert because you can rip into their experts as well. You can bring your own experts in to say all the things that you would have said anyway as an expert. And then you can then cross-examine their experts and rip them to pieces, you see, which is more or less exactly what happened. So now we move forward to the new case. So he found that, and then uh, he designated that there should be a new hearing. And this is the hearing we're talking about now, the one that's just finished. It started on the 13th of June, and it went on for three weeks. And it was one of the other lawyers who were there who were representing some of the other appellants, because I only represented two of them. He did say something along the lines that this was one of the most technically complicated scientific hearings that's ever occurred in English law. If that's true, I mean, even if it isn't true, it must be almost true, because I can tell you that there, it was an enormously big case. There were like maybe 50 or 60 of those big ring binders of evidence, of stuff that we had got out of the Ministry of Defence on, on disclosure requests, just endless, endless loads of documents that all had to be looked through for the purposes of finding uh, what actually really happened way back there a long time ago, you know, how much radiation got there, how it got there, whether it got there. Because, of course, the Ministry of Defence, just their main argument all the way through, almost from the beginning, well, no, actually from the beginning, is that nobody got exposed to any radiation at all, that these bombs were all exploded high up in the sky. They only exploded them when the wind was offshore, blowing them away from Christmas Island or wherever the men were, uh, and that nobody could possibly have got exposed to anything. So that was their argument. And, but various things emerged in the course of looking through all of the data that we got under disclosure and, and that was sent to us by other people and from freedom of information and all that kind of stuff, painted a completely different picture. What was the picture that was painted of the experience for the men who were in the military? Well, the principal argument here has to be between external radiation I mean, in fact, the argument is the same one as Hiroshima, you know. It's exactly the same as Hiroshima. In fact, we brought Professor Soji Sawada, who is an expert on Hiroshima, because he was blown up at Hiroshima. He studied Hiroshima, and he's, he's been able to show more or less what I'm now saying, which is that the concentration on acute external exposure to give the quantity called dose is a major error. The external radiation quantity dose does not represent the effects, the biological effects of internal radiation, especially from things like uranium and strontium-90 and these chemical DNA seekers. So we now know, as a result of an awful lot of research, both in the laboratory and also epidemiological research, that internal radiation produces an enormously high level of biological damage out of all proportion to its dose. And this was why we set up the European Committee on Radiation Risk in 1998 to address this problem. And a number of my experts that I brought in, that we flew in from all over the place, more or less put that issue directly into the court and argued and demonstrated, I guess, using peer review evidence, a massive amount of evidence after Chernobyl, particularly relating to genetic effects in children, because the other thing is we already, we already knew that the children in the, of the test veterans had a, a very high levels of congenital malformation, 10 times the national population. There have been three studies of these people. So we argued that these internal radionuclides, and particularly uranium, which is what the bombs were made of, and in fact the grapple Y bomb, the big three megaton bomb that the British exploded on Christmas Island, contained about three tons of uranium, you see. So when these things exploded, or even if they were high up, and even if they didn't produce fallout, but actually we now know that they did, the uranium itself got blown into lots of these nanoparticles, and then they all drifted down. And then they were inhaled by the people on Christmas Island, and they contaminated Christmas Island, and the same sort of thing happened at Maralinga. And these people inhaled this stuff, and it got into their bodies, and then it distributed more or less uniformly, gets through the lungs, and it's distributed through the bloodstream. And it gives very, very high doses to local, local tissue from the particles. And also, as it dissolves, it produces high concentrations of uranium, which then bind to the DNA. And, of course, the DNA is the target for these effects. So what we're saying is that it's not an issue of dose at all. It's an epidemiological... You've got to have an epidemiological approach to it and say, look... You start from the effect, and you say, if there's an effect, then there must have been a dose. For example, one thing that was done, and one piece of evidence that went in, 
is that in 2009, I think, an Australian university, Massey University, they did a study of chromosome aberrations in 50 New Zealand nuclear test veterans, and they compared them to controls, which were quite carefully collected, these controls, and they found that the New Zealand test veterans had three times the amount of chromosome damage, as shown by fluorescence immunoassay fish tests, than the controls. And they could relate the amount of chromosome damage to a dose. It's the same sort of thing that would have happened if they'd had an external dose of 1,000 millisieverts, or thereabouts. Now, obviously, these people weren't exposed to 1,000 millisieverts, but they were exposed to these uranium particles, you see. So the key to all of this, and of course this is also the same as nuclear power stations and Chernobyl and Fukushima and all of that, it's the same argument. These internal radionuclides cannot be assessed in terms of dose. So when they come along and they say about Fukushima, you know, the dose was really small, or they talk about the childhood leukemia clusters around nuclear power stations, they said the dose is ridiculously small, and so on. They're talking about something, that, about a quantity, dose, which is not scientifically credible when related to internal radionuclide exposure. It's a completely different thing, internal and external. They're completely different. So dose refers to an external amount that comes at a person or that somebody is exposed to, but that is completely different and, I don't want to say irrelevant, but it is not a good measure of the damage that can be done by an internal dose from inhaling, ingesting, or getting in from a cut on the skin. This, is always, this has actually always been a bone of contention. In fact, the famous health physicist, Carl Morgan, who's called the father of health physics, he had this argument way back in the 1950s when they first set up this whole idea of dose, and he was against it as a representation of internal radioactive effects. Because what dose is, technically, it's actually quite simple. Dose is energy per unit mass. So in other words, if you sit in front of a fire and you warm yourself and you get so many joules of energy, you dissolve that into your mass, and divide one by the other, and that gives you the dose. But you would get exactly the same dose if you reached into the fire and you got a hot coal and you ate it. Because the dose is averaged over the whole body or the whole organ, you see. This is, this is how the current risk model does it. So, for example, if somebody inhaled a load of uranium particles, what they would do is they would say, well, how many uranium particles are in the organ that you're interested in? Say, I don't know, the, the kidney, for example. And then they would work out all of the energy in terms of the amount of joules coming out due to the decays of the uranium particles. And then they would divide that by the mass of the kidney. Now, that would give you a very, very small dose. But actually, the dose to the local tissue, the dose to the, the cells that are very close to the uranium particles, is enormously high, enormously high. So this is the argument. Uh, and in fact, I won a case like uh, in Australia, a similar case. Uh, it was a, a pensions appeal case in Australia. And we won it entirely on this argument of dose because the tribunal in Australia, it, it was a case of a, of a man called Mahoney who got colon cancer after working in the ruins of Hiroshima, helping to clean it all up and so forth. He was working in the Australian army. And then he got colon cancer. And I argued that he would have swallowed some of these uranium particles and they would have lodged in his colon and given a very large dose to a little bit of the colon where the particle was. But the general dose to the whole colon was very small because, you know, if you divide the dose from the one particle into the whole colon, the dose is tiny. But as far as the cell is concerned, and of course, cancer starts in a single cell. It doesn't start in the whole colon. It starts in the cell next to where the particle was, you see. So they understood this, the tribunal. They said, yes, this is the right approach. And of course, the Australian National Radiological Protection Board, called ARPANSA, they came along and they made the normal argument that well, it should be the dose to the whole colon and so forth. And the tribunal threw that out. They said, no, that's not reasonable. So we're going to find, on the basis of Dr. Busby's evidence, we're going to find for Mr. Mahoney. So that was sort of a landmark case. At that point, in case you couldn't tell, Skype became overwhelmingly Skypish, and we had to take a brief break. So that's what I'm doing here to use this time to remind you that Nuclear Hot Seat is funded directly by you, the listeners. I could not get this show cranked out each week without your support. If you're a regular listener, you know that at this time, I'm raising funds to attend the Excellence in Journalism Conference being held mid-September in New Orleans. This will give me access to over 1,000 mainstream media reporters, news directors, syndicators, on-air talent, all those people responsible for whether or not your 
nuclear story gets covered. These will be people from the whole gamut of the news world, and I'll have access to them for three full days to lobby, plant story ideas, explain to them what the nuclear issues are in their part of the world, and whatever other mischief I can get into with them. Fingers crossed, I'll inspire some of those reporters to spill the beans as to what problems they've experienced while attempting to cover nuclear stories, and then I will share their stories with all of you. I've been able to book my flight to excellence in journalism because of some generous contributions, and thank you very much. But there are still a lot of other expenses that need to be covered. You know, food, hotel, bail. Just kidding on that last one. As well as all the regular monthly expenses that still need to be covered for the show. That's why I need your help, and why I'm asking you, yes, you, to help with this. Your donation of any size, from the equivalent of a cup of Starbucks and a tip, to the sky's the limit. It's all welcomed with my gratitude and with joy, because I take it as a tangible show of support for the work that I'm doing. So won't you help? It's easy. Just go to nuclearhotseat.com and click on the big red donate button. You can donate by PayPal, or you can use your credit card. And if you prefer the old-fashioned way, by sending a check, you can get a snail mail address to use by sending an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Whatever you can do to assist me and help the show, many, many thanks. As we get back to this week's interview with Dr. Christopher Busby, know that our reference to Sean means Sean Arclight, an esteemed activist. Colleague and supporter based in Ireland. Also, when Chris Busby says ICRP, that stands for the International Commission on Radiological Protection, which sets the world's standards for "quote unquote" acceptable radiation exposure. Chris is about to give you an earful on that one. Sean was telling me that there was the ability to challenge the Ministry of Defense because new parameters had been set on the science surrounding internal versus external radiation. Can you explain that? In general terms, this challenge to the internal-external argument has been happening since we set up the European Committee on Radiation Risk in、uh, 1998, and then we made our first report in 2003. And the second one in 2010, and that basically lays out our argument. But over the period of time, probably from about 2005 onwards, there's been increasingly evidence coming forward from a number of directions, both laboratory directions and from theoretical considerations and from epidemiology, that show that the current radiation risk model is is just completely wrong. People who've been exposed to internal radionuclides. The most critical and important one of these, I believe. Is an assault on the concept of the safety of exposure to radiation with, with regard to heritable defects, with regard to genetic damage. My colleague Inga Schmitz Feuerhacker from the University of Bremen, old lady, she's eighty. She's been working on this issue of radiation and its effects since she started, more or less, nineteen sixty-three. She and I and Dr. Sebastian Flugbeil. Wrote a paper in January, or was published a paper in January 2016, about the genetic effects of radiation after Chernobyl, and this is quite a big paper, and it got published by、uh, quite a fancy journal called the Environmental Health and Toxicology, which is a, a, the journal of the Korean Institute of Toxicology and Public Health, and what it shows is that the current radiation risk model is out by a factor of about 1,000 for. The assessment of heritable damage, of genetic damage from radiation. So, in other words, it's one thousand times out of alignment with what yes, the truth it, of the yeah, matter is. Yes, that's right. What it means is that the current risk model says that what's called the doubling dose, the amount of dose you get in order to double the level of genetic damage in offspring, is one thousand millisieverts. And what we did was we looked at a lot of papers from Europe and from Belarus and from the Soviet ex-Soviet Union territories and so on, and even as far afield as Egypt, that showed that after Chernobyl, like if you compare before Chernobyl with immediately after Chernobyl, there was a sharp jump 
in inheritable defects, in genetic damage, in all the populations that were studied. So you saw increases in Down syndrome, increases in congenital heart defect, in limb reduction defects, you know, when they don't have hands, in neural tube defects, in kidney defects. Just right across the board, there was a, a, an enormous and obvious and statistically significant increase in all of these effects after Chernobyl compared to before. And these all occurred at a dose of one millisievert. Now, what we're saying is that not like there were two or three, sometimes twice or three times the level that there was before. And we were seeing these at doses that can only have been one millisievert as assessed as an external dose by the current radiation system. So what it means is that what these mothers or fathers, the sperm, were being exposed to were small levels of the same stuff that the test veterans were being exposed to, and it was producing the same effect. It was producing these, these sharp increases in heritable defects. Now, this completely blows the current risk model out of the water because they say that, that there has been no observation of genetic defects at any level at all at Hiroshima, and so they take their genetic doubling dose from experiments on mice, external radiation dose experiments on mice. So th I think this is going to be a pivotal paper. I think this is going to change the whole playing field, this paper. Getting back to the case, how has this paper, how has this information and this new or evolving view of what the risk factor is played out in this case? And how cooperative has the Ministry of Defense and the court system been to you allowing this evidence in? Yes, well, that's a $64,000 question. The point is this, that we, we started this case with expert reports in October 2015. And these expert reports were there for the Ministry of Defense to respond to between then and the time that the case went into the Royal Courts of Justice. And they never responded to any of it. Not, they brought forward three of their expert witnesses, and none of these expert witnesses were asked to respond to any of the arguments that we advanced or respond to the documents we put in or, or this particular paper that we're talking about. And the reason this paper is important is because we also found, of course, that you had very high levels of genetic damage in the children of the veterans. So the argument was, and the judge accepted this argument in, in December at one of the procedural hearings, he said that he agreed that it was possible to use the genetic damage in the children as evidence that the parents had been exposed. So anyway, we put all this stuff in, massive amounts of stuff we put in there, and the Ministry of Defence blanked it all, totally blanked it all. And I thought at the time, the only way that they're going to be able to deal with this is to try and have all our experts thrown out. And so this is actually what they did. First of all, the first thing they did was they argued that none of that evidence should be allowed in because my name was on the paper. So that was the first thing, you know, if, I, if I'm not allowed to be an expert witness then clearly I'm not allowed to be an expert, and then clearly anything that has my name on it can't be considered to be expert, you see. So they argued that all that should be thrown out. And was but, that accepted by the court? Well, it was at first, yes, it was. It, in fact, we argued that it was certainly not what the original judge had decided. The original judge made the decision that Chris Busby couldn't be an expert witness because his enthusiasm might colour the way in which he was arguing, if you like to put it like that. But he never, he never argued that peer-reviewed papers written by Busby or as Busby as a co-author or any of that stuff should be excluded. But the current judge said that that was the case. It should be excluded. So what we did then is we said, well, all right, OK, if you're going to exclude this, we'll then put in all of the evidence that we relied on in that paper. So rather than just saying, here's the paper by Chris Busby in English, Mitzvah, Harker and Sebastian, here's all the papers that it relied on. So I rushed out and photocopied eight of these papers, and you have to make eight copies for the court, because there has to be one for this guy, one for that guy, three for the tribunal, you know, one for Jim, and, so, and all the rest of it. So we put those in, and those were accepted. So the information got in, but it wasn't credited to you, it was based on your source material. Yes, yes, that was the cunning plan. I mean, well, anyway, you know, we had to, we had to think on our feet, you know. I mean, at that point, it was like our entire case was down the drain. Well, not entirely, because that was just that particular paper. But quite a lot of our evidence was evidence that actually had Chris Busby written in it in some place or another, you know, because people refer to me and all that. I mean, I, I've become quite an expert in this field now. So, I mean, if you rule out anything that's got my name on it, you rule out about 50% of what we had. 
quite extraordinary. But anyway, the other 50% of what we had then was attempted to be ruled out by the Ministry of Defence in their closing submission. So right at the end of it all, they come along, this is like at the end of the three weeks, they come along with their closing submission and they say, look, what we say is this, is that all of these experts that Chris Busby brought in are all mates of Chris Busby, you know. They're all friends of his or they've known him or they're part of the ECRR or something like that. Therefore, we want to have all of their evidence chucked out, everything. So it means that the only experts that are left in the court, and by the way, they said, and by the way, the tribunal cannot act as an expert either, you know, because they're obviously not experts, you know, it's just, just a judge. And the two people that are there, even one of them was a medical woman, but she's not allowed to be an expert because she's not an expert on radiation, you see. So this is, this is the backstop. This is the fallback position of the Ministry of Defence. How successful was it? Were they able to get away with this? Well, I think he said no, he wasn't going to go as far as that. But I mean, I got a, cer- a certain degree of, um, what's the word, you know, uh, hostility from the tribunal. I, I certainly felt that the tribunal were not impressed. They went in there thinking that basically I came in there, you know, with my circus of my mates and so forth, you know, and they were set up to kind of not really agree with or believe anything that we said. I mean, it was really a bit sad. The point is, you've got to realize, or everyone has to realize, that we're dealing now with it. This is an end game. This is an end game. If we win this case, if they allow us to win this case, then that really is going to be the end of, the, of nuclear power. It's going to be the end of nuclear weapons. There are big stakes here. There are big stakes. This is a big deal. This is the Royal Courts of Justice in London. This is as high as you get. When are you going to find out what the ruling is? I think probably by September. I think they're going to have to go away and read all this stuff and try and figure out what it is they're going to do. I mean, I can't see how we're going to lose myself unless they throw out everything that we put in. I mean, they could do that. They could actually do that. They could say, well, you know, the ICRP risk model is the correct model. The governments of the world use it, therefore it must be right. And therefore, all of these arguments that it's wrong, you know, however they're presented and whatever the data is, cannot be accurate. And therefore, we're going to consider that they've all been introduced by people who are basically activists, I guess, and we're going to discard it all. I mean, they could do that. It's possible. Are there any precedents in international law that support your case or that make this point in a way that cannot be avoided, or is this the case that's supposed to do it? No, no, this is it. This is it. This is it. Anything else that you can do between now and the determination or the case is over and now you just have to wait it out? Well, this is an argument that I had after the case with all of my colleagues. The thing was so stressful that one of the people who was working with me, Group Captain Andrew Ades, had a heart attack and disappeared. So I had to bring in my daughter, Dr. Cecilia Busby, to help me. And she was absolutely brilliant because she's a clever woman and she knows a lot of the science too because we've talked this through for a very long time. And so she came in, but she and all of the other people, they said, look, whatever you do, Dad, she said, or, and the other said, Chris, you know, don't go out and talk about this on the radio and keep your head down and otherwise you'll piss off the judge. And I had a huge argument with them about that, I really did, because I said, look, what on earth is the point of me not saying anything about what really happened until after it's all over? Because after all, if it's all over and he finds against us, then what's going to be the point of me saying boo-hoo, you know, it was all a stitch-up? If I sort of argue this beforehand and enough people hear about it and they get annoyed enough, you know, It may be that there can be some sort of public pressure or at least some public understanding or appreciation of what's going on, which might might put some kind of political pressure on the system in some way. Because I I, I certainly don't believe, I have never believed that judges and, and, you know, if you like, the legal system is independent of politics. You know, It, it would be insane to imagine that. I've seen enough of this happen in America. I've seen enough of it happen in England. I did think a bit about it before I decided to talk to you and to Sean. And I thought, well, no. And also, apart from anything else, we've been helped by an awful lot of people, you know, because we we had to pay for people to be flown in all over the place, and we had to put them up in London for several days and ferry them about the place and so on. It's cost quite a lot of money, and we don't have any money. So lots and lots of widows' mites have come in, you know, five pounds here, ten pounds there, five hundred here. We've made enough, and I think it's our duty, really, to explain to the people that have helped us what actually happened and what's been happening. Um, so that's why I decided to talk to you about it all, you know, and to, and to sort of, well, not so much blow the whistle, but at least tell you or tell whoever's listening 
what really happened in that court thing over the three weeks that we were there. I think we were very good, Libby. I think we were very good. I, I don't think anybody could have done better than we did. You know, we've got three of the most, well, four important major scientific experts who laid out the ground that showed that the ICRP risk model was wrong, that laid out the arguments to show that these guys were exposed to radiation because the winds weren't blowing in the direction that they said they were blowing, they actually were blowing in a different direction. All of this evidence came in. All of it's there in front of the judge to make the decision. And I certainly hope that he makes a decision which is the one that goes along with the evidence. The only way that he can't go along with it is if he throws all of the evidence out and says it's all worthless. Chris, is there anything you want to add that will round this out? Anything you feel you need to say? Well, okay, I'll say this. that If you were to plot on a graph the direction that, that the argument that we have put forward is going, that is to say that internal radiation cannot be assessed in terms of external dosimetry, then the evidence increases every single month. Every few months, another brick is removed from the citadel of the current radiation risk model. And when all of the cancers start to come through and the congenital malformations and so forth come through from Fukushima, as they will, as they have over the last 30 years come through from Chernobyl, it will be perfectly clear to everybody that very, very small amounts of radiation, internal radiation, are absolutely deadly. And so this risk model will go down. So history will judge that we are right. It's just a question of how long it will take. Dr. Christopher Busby. The best way to connect with Chris Busby is on Facebook. Activist shout out. I have got to acknowledge Erica Gray for her spot on sharing of the NRC reports. The duck and cover report could not happen without her. And bravo with a big muzzle tov to the Westlake landfill activist at the Democratic National Convention for what looked like a die in staged to get support for House Bill 4100, which would require the Secretary of the Army, acting through the Army Corps of Engineers, to undertake remediation oversight of the Westlake Landfill, located in Bridgeton, Missouri. Well done, and here's hoping it did some good. Here's this week's final thought. I never know where an interview subject will come from. So I was excited when a new friend mentioned that her father had worked as a nuclear engineer and been involved from the early days of the industry, helping to build some of the first reactors. But something happened for him around the time that Three Mile Island was being built, something regarding that reactor, and that led him to quit the industry, or at least change his professional focus. He was, of course, pro-nuclear, but I thought his historical perspective could prove interesting. She got his permission for me to call. Well, this gentleman, we'll call him Bill, is over 90 years old and, of course, still pro-nuclear. I was just calling to see if he wanted to be interviewed and, if so, to set up a time. But at first he just jumped right in and launched into his stories, which could be labeled nuclear's greatest hits from the perspective of somebody who was part of it a long time ago. I was honest with him about my perspective, I don't think I have to explain it to any regular listeners of this show. And he then started challenging me that while I might have a perspective and a focus, he was the only one on the phone who had real knowledge. Was I an engineer? A scientist? Ha! I couldn't possibly know blah, blah, blah. Then he ratcheted it up to where he was nearly yelling at me. That nuclear was the greatest thing that ever happened to this planet. It was cheap energy, clean energy. Radiation doesn't harm you. If you're afraid, it makes no sense at all. I swear, he sounded like he was stuck in Eisenhower's Adams for Peace propaganda. I could not get a word in edgewise. But then he said, there is nothing wrong with nuclear. And I simply shot back, the waste bill. The radioactive waste. Plutonium contaminated fuel rods and fuel bundles with a 24,000 year half life, and we have no safe way to store it or neutralize the radiation. That's when he kind of lost it for real, building a crescendo of abuse that he heaped at me, ending with, And if you think you know what happened at Three Mile Island, you don't, and you never will. 
goodbye. So that left me with three thoughts. First, this was an interview that was never going to happen. Second, it appears that if you ever find yourself in an argument with a pro-nuker who claims that nuclear energy is the best thing since sliced bread, always bring up plutonium-contaminated radioactive waste, half-life of 24,000 years, no way to store it or neutralize the deadly radiation, and then stand back because their heads will explode. Finally, is there a bigger or at least a different story about Three Mile Island that we, or maybe it's just I, don't know? I'm willing to bet that Eric Epstein or Scott Portsline from TMI Alert, Three Mile Island Alert, would know a thing or two or twelve about this. Great to get started on that research now, so I'll have it ready for next March's Three Mile Island anniversary special. Whatever I find out, you know that I will let you know. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 26, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from RT.com, Greenpeace, JapanTimes.co.jp, FukuLeaks.org, Fukushima-Diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, Asahi.com, Forbes.com, ASIA.Nikkei.com, SaltLakeTribune.com, OAOA.com, Westlake Landfill on Facebook, NJ.com, Patch.com, Fool.com, EcoWatch.com, OpenCulture.com, GlobeAndMail.com, MiningAwareness.WordPress.com, NSNBC.com, Reuters.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the highly motivated, mostly self-taught, genius activists who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, which you are all invited to join and like us and comment on the stories. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewZSentinel.com, and broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We're always looking for other stations and networks to connect with. So if you know of an online news aggregator or community radio station, or heck, your own website and you want to connect and want to carry the show, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Don't worry, I make it easy for everyone. If you sign up on the website, you will receive an email link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat episode. And as a bonus, you'll get a chapter from my ebook. Yes, I Glow in the Dark. One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. The full book is available on Amazon. And a reminder that it's your contributions that help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news with an attitude. So please do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating. Reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded every month in 112 countries. We are not alone with our concerns, and activists around the world are linking because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't anybody go back to sleep, because we are all in the Nuclear Hot Seat. Nuclear Hot Seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.